gonna drink. Ah, perfect. And we've already opened the page to the first chapter. Cram and punch me. It's actually kind of funny that both of these Russian authors have books with complex ideas. Like, word and word is like the context, the template, if you will, of titles of major books of this period. It's like War and Peace, Crime and Punishment. Uh huh. Um, government and politics, like like, like kind of like that, like <laughs> big idea and big idea. Okay, and yeah, I think it's a good choice for the show because, well. We're reading Russian authors right now, so it kind of makes sense from a thematic standpoint, point of view. So, like thematic and cultural standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Like our Russian authors, and then we might get into American literature later. Other world authors. Yeah, so here we go. This is uh, Crime and Punishment, Part 1, Chapter 1. Yesterday we learned a little bit about Theodore Dostoevsky's background, how he was imprisoned for participating in anti-government activities, anti-SAR readings and idea sharing. He was put on a mock trial and... a little bit about his time in the prison system and how it probably informed some of the writings in this book. Okay. Yeah, yesterday we mainly learned about his background. Okay, here we go. On an exceptionally hot evening early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S place and walked slowly, as though in hesitation towards Cambridge. What's surprising is that it's saying that it's hot. Yeah, hot evening in early July, which I think is a bit surprising considering that this is a Russian author writing. Russia's pretty uh, notorious for being cold practically year round. It's like Alaska in a way. It's like it's cold all the time. Hmm. Let me take a look. So Moscow weather right now is yeah, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Cold as heck. <laughs> Cold and rainy. <laughs> and then if we look at Moscow weather in July, the high is 76. Now, it might have been different in those days. But I would think with global warming that the opposite would be true. That it would only be getting hotter. So I don't really know. Maybe it's just uncharacteristically hot. Like maybe it's in the 80s. But even still, like, the 80s can feel pretty nice. Especially if there's a breeze going through. Like once you start getting into the 90s and the 100s, like then it starts feeling like... Like the world's trying to kill me. <laughs> but... Yeah, like 70s like mid 70s like this is saying 
in July, that's the high. Like that, that's perfect. Like that's where you want to be in July. It's like in Moscow. Yeah, that's like conditions are like perfect compared to the rest of the year. It might be considered hot, but. Compared to the rest of the world, it's, yeah, it's not that bad. Like, compare that to, uh, like, what's a particularly hot country? I'd say maybe Egypt or Sudan. Like, let's look at Sudan's weather in July. Daily highs from 102 to 98 degrees and that's cartoon so yeah that's hot in July <laughs> Phoenix Arizona hot in July Moscow perfect in July okay <laughs> but yeah this it might be hot hot in comparison to how it normally is maybe that's why he says exceptionally hot but yeah, he had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high five-story house. It was more like a cupboard than a room. Uh, what does Garrett mean? I have a cousin named Garrett, funnily enough, but I think this is used in a different context. Yeah, Garrett here means top floor or attic room, especially a small dismal one, traditionally inhabited by an artist. Fascinating, actually. <coughs> um, it comes from Middle English Watchtower. We grew up in Hem Attic, but we, like, never went in there. Like, we actually never went in there. I think it was used for, like, storage. Um, yeah, and even then, I think the things that were stored there were things that we, we never needed. Like, Christmas lights and stuff like that. <laughs> Most of our stuff was stored in the garage, not in the attic. I think the only time I ever heard of anyone going in the attic was to get Christmas lights down for Christmas. People definitely did not live in there, <laughs> in the attic. And the place I'm staying now, I don't think this place even has an attic. Yeah, I don't think so. The landlady who provided him with Garrett dinners and attendance lived on the floor below. And every time he went out, he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed, the young man had a sick, frightening, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. Probably because he's living in an attic. <laughs> Like that, that can't be good for you to stay in those cramped spaces. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. Already I can tell you that Dostoevsky has a, a way with words. He's done a great job of setting up Uh, what's it called, like providing us with the setting, the place, pieces he's already starting to lay out. He's introduced the young man and his landlady, even already revealing a little bit about their relationship. And 
and it's not like War and Peace. Like, Dio like introduces like ten characters off the bat. <laughs> like in this, in this chapter, Crime and Punishment, it looks more like, and it seems more like he adores more concern with events. Let me keep reading though. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary, but for some time past he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. Hmm. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and isolated from his fellows that he dreaded meeting. Not only his landlady, but anyone at all. Yeah. Sometimes, like, introverted people will get this way. I mean, I've even been like this sometimes, where it's like, I just don't want to see anybody at all. Or talk to anybody. Hmm. Let's see what we're learning about this character. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had a real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs to pestering demands for payment, threats and complaints, and to rack his brains for excuses, to prevaricate to lie. No, rather than that, he would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. Prevaricate means to speak or act in an evasive way. He seemed to prevaricate when journalists ask pointed questions, like he try to change the subject. What does that remind me of? Like, I guess it kind of reminds me of like one of those like murder mysteries or something, and like a cop or something comes to the door and they're like trying to ask, like, "Have you seen that person?" And it's like, "No, I haven't seen him." And they're like, "Um." their bodies like under the bed or something like that just, yeah just don't go in don't go in there okay it's like they're trying to cover it up like that's kind of what it reminds me of but in his case he just doesn't want to be hassled about the rent this evening however on coming out into the street he became acutely aware of his fears I want to attempt a thing like that. I am frightened by these trifles. He thought with an odd smile. Hmm. Yes. All is in a man's hands, and he lets it all slip from cowardice. That's an axiom. It would be interesting to know what it is men are most afraid of. Um... Yeah, I'd say it varies from guy to guy, but I'd say most guys are probably afraid of going broke, uh, losing their job and or ability to provide for their family. Like, that's probably the greatest fear of most men, losing their ability to provide, getting like sick or something like that. Um, yeah, different guys are afraid of different things, I'd say, but most guys are afraid of that. Taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what they fear most. But I am talking too much. Because I chatter that I do nothing. Or perhaps it is that I chatter because I do nothing. It's like you're talking to fill in the... the um, fill in the conversation. <laughs> He 
he's like, maybe I'm talking a lot and that's why I'm not doing anything. Or maybe it's because I'm not doing anything and that's why I'm talking a lot. <laughs> it helps me pass the time to talk. I've learned to chatter this last month, lying for days together in my den thinking of Jack the Giant Killer. Why am I going there now? Am I capable of that? Is that serious? It's not serious at all. It's simply a fantasy to amuse myself, a plaything. Yes, maybe it is a plaything. It's going where, though? Oh, his den? Okay, I... Wait, wait, wait. I guess his, his den, I guess. The heat in the street was terrible. The airlessness, the bustle, and the plaster, scaffolding, bricks, and dust all about him. And that special Petersburg stench, so familiar to all who are unable to get out of town in summer, all worked painfully upon a young man's already overwrought nerves. Weather-wise, I don't think that St. Petersburg is very different from Moscow. Like if you look at a map, they're somewhat close. Like, yeah, um, let me check to see... Yeah, St. Petersburg to Moscow is about a seven hour drive, which is about the distance of uh, San, I want to say San Diego and San Francisco, about maybe San Francisco to LA would be a little bit closer. Yeah, I'd say it's probably more like San Francisco to San Diego. That's how close they are, though. And St. Petersburg is also f seven hours north. It's like north, uh, northwest of Moscow. And usually when you go north, it gets colder. We know that because birds fly f south for the winter. So if you, the further south you go, the hotter or warmer it gets. Um, let's see, what else do I want to look at? St. Petersburg weather. In July. Okay, 90 degrees, wow. 91 degrees. So yeah, it is warmer. Um, I wonder why that is. Maybe it has to do with elevation. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. It is bordering the Gulf of Finland, St. Petersburg. Really interesting. Okay, I want to get a refill. I'll be right back. Yeah, there is a lot. While I'm in the process of refilling my drink, there is a lot you can learn from just looking at a map. As for why St. Petersburg is warmer than Moscow in the summertime, I'm not 100% sure. I might be able to figure it out, but I assume it has to do with elevation. Okay.
are back. Got my bubbly cola. <laughs> yet and I don't know maybe since the start cutting back on that stuff I've been the type of guy that would drink to feel better in the past it's like when I'm feeling like the world sucks and everything sucks and I'm lonely and I hate everything I would drink to feel better but I was never someone who got like addicted to alcohol or alcoholic um, yeah it was always something that I could choose to partake in and I never really relied on it too much I may drink less over time or only on like specific occasions like parties and stuff in the future okay so yes yeah, st. Petersburg uh, let me see if Google knows. St. Petersburg. I believe it was given that name by Peter the Great, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's not what I want to know, though. Why is St. Petersburg hotter than Moscow? Is what I want to know. What's interesting is even Travel Russia, this blog says that weather averages in St. Petersburg are generally lower than for Russia's capital. But July and August are the hottest months. Um, the average temperature during summers is usually 18 degrees. 64. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would say elevation if anyone asked me why is St. Petersburg hotter than Moscow in the summertime. Okie doke. The heat, yeah, the heat was terrible in the street. And it stomped. That's the way that it is in crowded cities. I think it is less the case now that we have advances in sewage and stuff like that but in those days I don't think they had like garbage trucks and stuff yeah they didn't have garbage trucks picking up your trash I think it wasn't that uncommon for people to just throw their trash out on the street and that is why it stunk a lot yeah they just didn't have sewage treatment um, hold on a second. Yeah. There weren't, they didn't have the advances that we have today of water supply and sanitation processes. And that, I think, made it even worse. <laughs> the smell in the big cities. saying that most houses had their own private toilet, sewage was disposed of through underground drains built with carefully laid bricks. So, yeah, I guess it depends on how sewage is treated, basically. Okay. But here, yeah. Not, not done well. All worked painfully upon the young man's already overwrought nerves. The insufferable stench from the pot houses, which are particularly numerous in that part of town, and the drunken men whom he met continually, although it was a working day, completed the revolting misery of the picture. Yeah. 
Yeah, drinking is has probably always been a big big thing in Russia. It's like vodka. Expression of the profoundest disgust clean for a moment in the young man's refined face. He's like, ah, it's hot, it stinks, and now I have these drunk guys <laughs> talking to me. He was, by the way, exceptionally handsome, above the average in height. Slim, well built, with beautiful dark eyes and dark brown hair. So he sank into deep thought, or more accurately, speaking into a complete blankness of mind. He walked along, not observing what was about him and not caring to observe it. So it's like he just, he's not looking at anyone. He's not trying to engage anyone in conversation. He's just, he's just walking. <laughs> from time to time, he would mutter something from the habit of talking himself, to which he had just confessed. Actually, it's pretty fascinating. I think that people talking to themselves is a sign of higher intelligence. And I don't know why that is. Like, I think that people who think, who think or talk out loud, if they're not talking to anyone in particular, like, if they are talking to somebody that isn't there, it could be a sign of psychosis or, like, schizophrenia. For example, it's like they're hallucinating someone there. That could be signs of mental illness. But if they're like narrating their thoughts or like talking out loud, thinking out loud to knit, to organize their ideas, I think that's a sign of intelligence. It's like scientists in a lab. Sometimes you'll see it with them too, where it's like they're focused on their research and it's like when they say what they're seeing even if no one's there it helps them understand the nature of the observation they're making it's like oh so that's how these atoms interact or that yeah that's how that chemical process occurs Yeah, I would say it's a good tool for organizing ideas. Assuming, of course, that it's not mental. I don't think it's the case of mental illness with this guy. I think it's the case that he's organizing his ideas. At these moments, he would become conscious that his ideas were sometimes in a tangle and that he was very weak. For two days, he had scarcely tasted food. Yep, cluttered mind. And talking to himself helps him to clean some of those cobwebs up there. Maybe not cobwebs, but sometimes your brain tracks complex ideas. And by writing some of those ideas down or t thinking them out loud, it helps you to make sense of those complex ideas. He was so badly dressed that even a man accustomed to shabbiness would have been ashamed to be seen in the street in such rags. He's scraping by for cash, so that could have something to do with it. Like, yeah, he's, he's behind on rent, so that, that could be connected. Something that... I think I might have talked about yesterday is that people's lives tend to work off of momentums. So it's like rich people are able to invest their money. They're able to do stuff like buy houses, fix them up, and then sell them. So the rich get richer. Meanwhile, the poor, you know, they can't hold down a steady job. They 
are spending whatever they get to make ends meet. They're living paycheck to paycheck or, you know, living off of government programs and assistance. It's like it's harder for them because they're trying to play those cards and their cards are not the same. Yeah, the cards are not the same. In that quarter of the town, however, scarcely any shortcoming in dress would have created a surprise. So this is the... What was it called? The rough part of town? Owned to the proximity of the Haymarket, the number of establishments of bad character, the preponderance of the trading and working class population crowded in these streets and alleys in the heart of Petersburg, Types so various were to be seen in the streets that no figure, however queer, would have caused surprise. It's like a marketplace, like everyone's there. But there was such accumulated bitterness and contempt in the young man's heart that, in spite of all the fastidiousness of youth, he minded his rags least of all in the street. It was a different matter when he met with acquaintances or with former fellow students, whom indeed he disliked meeting at any time. He's like becoming less social. He's like, Ugh, I don't want to talk to anybody. Be gone. And yet when a drunken man, who for some unknown reason was being taken somewhere in a huge wagon, dragged by a heavy dray horse, suddenly shouted at him as he drove past, Hey there, German Hatter. Bawling at the top of his voice and pointing at him, the young man stopped suddenly and clutched tremulously at his hat. It was a tall round hat from Zimmerman's, but completely worn out. Rusty with age, all torn and bespattered, brimless, and bent on one side in a most unseemly fashion. Not shame, however, but quite another feeling akin to terror had overtaken him. Again, his clothes are worn. I have absolutely no idea what this has to do with Germany. <laughs> But who knows? Yeah, he his clothes are. He needs to go clothes shopping, but he has no money. I knew it. He muttered in confusion. I thought so. That's the worst of all. Why a stupid thing like this, the most trivial detail, might spoil the whole plan? Yes, my hat is too noticeable. It looks absurd, and that makes it noticeable. With my rags, I have to wear a cap. Any sort of old pancake, but not this grotesque thing. Nobody wears such a hat. It would be noticed a mile off. It would be remembered. What matters is that people would remember it, and that would give them a clue. For this business, one should be as little conspicuous as possible. Trifles. Trifles are what matter. Why, it is such trifles that always ruin everything. <laughs> it's like it helps him stand out when his clothes are destroyed. <laughs> Everyone else looks nice, but he's walking around in rags and with torn clothes, and so everyone notices him more. He had not far to go. He knew indeed how many steps it was from the gate for his lodging house. Exactly 730. He'd counted them once when he'd been lost in dreams. At the time, he had put no faith in those dreams and was only tantalizing himself by their hideous but daring recklessness. Now, a month later, he had begun to look upon them differently, and in spite of the monologues in which he jeered at his own impotence and indecision, he had involuntarily come to regard this hideous dream as an exploit to be attempted. Although he still did not realize this himself. He was positively going now for a rehearsal of his project. And at every step his excitement grew more and more violent. Uh, yeah, what kind of dream was it? I said it was a hideous dream, but what's that supposed to mean? Whew. <sighs> I don't know, with a 
sinking heart and a nervous tremor, he went up to a huge house, which on one side looked onto the canal and on the other into the street. The, this house was let out in tiny tenements and was inhabited by working people of all kinds. Tailors, locksmiths, cooks, Germans of sorts, girls picking up a living as best they could, petty clerks, etc. There was a continual coming and going through the two gates and in the two courtyards of the house. Three or four doorkeepers were employed on the, on the building. The young man was very glad to meet none of them, and at once slipped unnoticed through the door on the right and up the staircase. It was a back staircase, dark and narrow, but he was familiar with it already and knew his way, and he liked all these surroundings. In such darkness, even the most inquisitive eyes were not to be dreaded. It's like, um... In... In scary places, it's easier to make friends. <laughs> I'm so scared now, what would it be if it somehow came to pass that I were really going to do it? He cannot help asking himself as he reached the fourth story. There his progress was barred by some porters who were engaged in moving furniture out of a flat. He knew that the flat had been occupied by a German clerk in the civil service and his family. This German was moving out then, and so the fourth floor on the staircase would be untenanted, untenanted, Set by the old woman. And that's a good thing anyway, he thought to himself as he rang the bell of the old woman's flat. The bell gave a faint tickle, tinkle as though it were made of tin and not of copper. The little flats in such houses always have bells that ring like that. He'd forgotten the note of that bell. And now the peculiar tinkle seemed to remind him of something and to, to bring it clearly before him. He started, his nerves were terribly overstrained by now. In a little while, the door was opened a tiny crack. The old woman eyed her visitor with evident distrust through the crack. And nothing could be seen but her little eyes, glittering in, dark, in the darkness. Yeah. It's like there's like a, a balance of how many people <laughs> is the ideal number in your place that you live. Sometimes you just like to have a giant place to yourself. In his case, he's glad that the this German's moving out because it's fewer people. <laughs> but seeing a number of people on the landing, she grew bolder and opened the door wide. The young man stepped into the dark entry, which was partitioned off from the tiny kitchen. The old woman stood facing him in silence and looked looking inquiringly at him. She is a diminutive, withered-up old woman of 60, with sharp malignant eyes and a sharp little nose. Her colorless, somewhat grizzled hair was thickly smeared with oil, and she wore no kerchief over it. Around her thin, long neck, <laughs> I just thought it was kind of funny. It's like, when you get that old, it's like, some people just stop caring. <laughs> And some people are still trying to hold on to their beauty however they can. But yeah, beauty fades with age. Like it or not. And some people go with it and some people try to go against it. Around her thin long neck, which looked like a hen's leg, was knotted some sort of flannel rag. And in spite of the heat, there hung flapping on her shoulders a mangy fur cape, yellow with age. The young man must have looked at her with a rather peculiar expression, for a gleam of mistrust came into her eyes again. Raskolin... Hang on a second. Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov. A student. He came here a month ago. The young man made haste to mutter, with a half bow, remembering that he ought to be more polite. I remember, my good sir, I remember quite well you're coming here, the old woman said distinctly, still keeping her inquiring eyes on his face. And here I am again on the same errand, Raskolnikov continued, a little disconcerted and surprised at the old woman's mistrust. 
Perhaps she's always like that, though. Only I did not notice it the other time. He thought it. He thought with an uneasy feeling. The old woman paused as though hesitating, then stepped on one side, pointing to the door of the room, she said, letting her visitor pass in front of her. Step in, my good sir. The little room into which the young man walked with yellow paper on the walls, geraniums, and muslin curtains in the windows was brightly lighted up at the moment by the setting sun. I think we're going to figure out why he's visiting her soon, but I don't know yet. But the sun will shine like this then, too, flashed as it were by chance through Raskolnikov's mind, and with a rapid glance, he scanned everything in the room trying as far as possible to notice and remember its arrangement. But there was nothing special in the room. The furniture, all very old and of yellow wood, consisted of a sofa with a huge bent wooden back, an oval table in front of the sofa, a dressing table with a looking glass fixed on it between the windows, chairs along the walls, and two or three halfpenny prints in yellow frames, representing German damsels with birds in their hands. That was all. He's like casing the joint. He's like, hmm, how much of this stuff am I going to be able to steal when the old lady keeps the book here? <laughs> now, um, uh, imagining things. In the corner, a light was burning before a small icon. I mean, he might be trying to steal some of this stuff. Who knows? Everything was very clean. The floor and the furniture were brightly polished. Everything shone. Liz, 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 Lizavita's work. Yeah, Lizavita's work, thought the young man. There was not a speck of dust to be seen in the whole flat. Wow, she does a good job cleaning, man. It's in the houses of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness. Raskolnikov thought again, and he stole a curious glance at the cotton curtain over the door leading into another tiny room, in which stood the old woman's bed and chest of drawers, and into which he had never looked before. It's like they have this time, they use it to clean. <laughs> These two rooms made up the whole flat. What do you want? The old woman said severely, coming into the room and, as before, standing in front of him as to look him straight in the face. Yeah, it seems like she doesn't want to see him either. <laughs> I've brought something to pawn here and he drew out of his pocket an old-fashioned flat silver watch, on the back of which was engraved with a globe. The chain was of steel. By the time it is up for your last pledge, uh, sorry, but the time is up for your last pledge. The month was up the day before yesterday. I'll bring you the interest for another month. Wait a little. Is this his landlady? But that's for me to do as I please, my good sir, to wait or to sell your pledge at once. How much will you give me for the watch, Yona Ivanovna? You come with such trifles, my good sir, it is scarcely worth anything. But it's silver. It's a silver watch. <laughs> See, where was I? Yeah, it's scarcely, scarcely worth anything. I gave you two rubles last time for your ring, and one could buy it quite new at a jeweler's for a ruble and a half. Dang. <laughs> Give me four rubles for it. I shall redeem it, which was my father's. I should be getting some money soon. It kind of reminds me of that... I was watching this movie on Netflix yesterday called, uh, I think, No One's Getting Out Alive. I think it is. that no one gets out alive. Yeah, I think it's no one gets out alive. And she's kind of like this guy. <laughs> yeah, she's kind of like this guy. She's trying to get money together. In her case, she's a... I don't want to spoil too much of the film because it's really good. No one gets out alive. She's basically an immigrant, and she's, I mean, you, you can guess the rest. <laughs> like, 
th things get hard. <laughs> like, yeah. But in his case, in his case, yeah, he, yeah, he's he's a lot like her. <laughs> he is somehow. He's like her. I'll be getting some money soon. She, she, in, in her case, it's kind of like what I was talking about, where it's like things just go from bad to worse. It's like, it's like someone steals her money and then she loses her job. It, yeah, it just goes from it goes from bad to worse. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be getting some money soon. Ruble and a half, and interesting in advance if you like. A ruble and a half, cried the young man. This is worth at least three rubles. How could you do this to me? <laughs> Please yourself. And the woman handed him back the watch. It's like you always know who who's holding the most cards, too. Who's holding the most poker chips. Because they're always the most cocky and confident. Anyone who's been in a pawn shop recently knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, I'll pay you two bucks for it. But it's worth two thousand dollars, <laughs> like two bucks. Take your leap. <laughs> but it's, it's the priceless the artifact out of the Indiana Jones movie. It's worth at least two million bucks. Ten bucks. <laughs> it's like you can see it on any episode of Pawn Stars. <laughs> like they. They swindle their customers left, right, and center, but that's because that's how they make their money. They buy low, buy low, 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 low as you can. You can sell it and make a buck. Yeah, please yourself. And the old woman handed him back to watch. It's like she does not need money, but he does. The young man took it and was so angry that he was on the point of going away, but checked himself at once, remembering that there was nowhere else he could go, and that he had had another object also in coming. Hand it over, he said roughly. The old woman fumbled in her pocket for her keys and disappeared behind a curtain into the other room. The young man, left standing alone in the middle of the room, listened inquisitively, thinking. He could hear her unlocking the chest of drawers. It must be the top drawer, he reflected. So she carries the keys in a pocket on the right. All in one bunch on a steel ring. And there's one key there. Three times as big as all the others, with deep notches. That can't be the key of the chest of drawers. Then there must be some other chest or strong box. That's worth knowing. Strong boxes always had keys like that. But how degrading it all is. Yeah, I think he's thinking of stealing some of this stuff. The old woman came back. Here, sir, as we say, 10 copics. A ruble a month. So I must take 15 copics from a ruble and a half for the month in advance. I need to look at Russian currency. There's rubles. How many rub how many copics are in a ruble? <laughs> Public See if there's a video that you guys can watch while I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> would be nice. Would be nice. Okay. Do we have? I'm 
know why we can't hear anything. <clears throat> Maybe I can try watching it on YouTube. Yeah, because like we can hear through the speakers. I guess it's video only. Quick scan. Okay. Let me see if you guys can see it. Yeah, it's just a breakdown of Russian money. Should be getting back by the time it's done. Showing you the actual dollars, what they look like. Okay, cool books or coins. Let me see if I can just Google it. Kopex and a ruble. So ruble is like a dollar. Kopex are like cents. Okay, that's pretty st simple. Kopex are coins, basically. Coins and rubles are dollars. Okay. Where are we? She's talking yet. Here, sir, we say 10 copics the ruble a month. So it's a dollar and 10 versus rent. Back in those days, I think it was worth a lot more than it is today, much like the US dollar. So I must take 15 copics from a ruble and a half a month in advance. these money people it's like we have to do some quick math just to figure out what the heck this woman's talking about 15 copex from a ruble and a half for the month in advance yeah so a dollar ten is the monthly rent I must take 15 copex from a ruble and a half for the month in advance. So a ruble and a half is a buck fifty. Fifteen copics from that. So that would be fifteen copics would be fifteen cents. So that becomes a dollar a ruble thirty-five copics. How is she getting that? I don't know. No idea. 
Maybe it has to do with the fact that he's behind on rent. Maybe that's why. But for the two rubles I lent you before, you owe me now 20 kopecks on the same reckoning in advance. So she gave me two bucks before to help him out. And now he owes us two dollars and twenty cents now because of interest. That makes 35 kopecks altogether. Again, it's like, she's talking money talk. <laughs> she's talking in currency. I hate money, like, honestly. I, I, I just wish people could figure out a way to just abolish that. Like, just get rid of it. It sucks. It's tedious. It makes people do stupid and, yes, uh, unethical stuff. So I must give you a ruble and 15 kopecks for the watch. Here it is. But again, I have no clue what this woman's talking about. That makes 35 kopecks. Where, where the heck did you get 35 cents from? I'll give you a ruble and 15 kopecks for the watch. So maybe she's taking the interest out of what she would pay him for the watch. What? Only a ruble and 15 kopecks now? Just so. I took out the interest. <laughs> Young man did not dispute it and took the money. Yeah, it's like people who need money really badly are willing to accept less. Just how it is. He looked at the old woman and was in no hurry to get away, as though there was still something he wanted to say or to do, but he did not himself quite know what. I may be bringing you something else in a day or two. Aliona Ivanova, Ivan a valuable thing. Silver. A cigarette box. As soon as I get it back from a friend. He broke off in confusion. We will talk about it then, sir. Goodbye. Are you always at home alone? Your sister is not here with you? He asked her as casually as possible as he went out into the passage. They're like, yeah, I think he was gonna try to come by and take some stuff. Some stuff that he can use to pay the rent. What business is she of yours, my good sir? to know if anyone's going to be watching the place. That's what I have to know. Of course, he's not going to say that. <laughs> oh, nothing particular, I simply asked. You're too quick. Good day, Eliona. Eliona Ivanovna. Raskolnikov went out in complete confusion. This confusion became more and more intense. As he went down the stairs, he even stopped short two or three times as though suddenly struck by some thought. When he was in the street, he cried out, Oh God, how loathsome it all is. And can I, can I possibly? No, it's nonsense, it's rubbish, he added resolutely. And how could such an atrocious thing come into my head? What filthy things my heart is capable of? Yes, filthy above all, disgusting, loathsome, loathsome. And for a whole month I've been... But no words, no exclamations could express his agitation. A feeling of intense repulsion which had begun to oppress and torture his heart. Now he was on his way to the old woman, had by now reached such a pitch, had taken such a definite form, that he did not know what to do with himself to escape from his wretchedness. Dang. <laughs> Walk, yeah, he walked along the pavement like a drunken man, regardless of the passers-by and jostling against them, and only came to his senses when he was in the next street. Looking around, he noticed that he was standing close to a tavern, which was entered by steps leading from the pavement to the basement. At that instant, two drunken men came out at the door and, abusing and supporting one another, they mounted the steps. Without stopping to think, Raskolnikov went down the steps at once. 
From that moment, he had never been into a tavern, but now he felt giddy and was tormented by a burning thirst. He longed for a drink of cold beer and attributed his sudden weakness to the want of food. He sat down at a sticky little table in a dark and dirty corner. In a dark and dirty corner, he ordered some some beer and eagerly drank off the first glassful. At once, he felt easier, and his thoughts became clear. I can think a little better when my lips are a little wetter, don't you? <laughs> Jet said, "Go reference on that." I've been thinking that I've been drinking a little more than I should. I think that's how the song goes, something like that. I can sit and think a little better when my lips are a little better, don't you? All that's nonsense, he said hopefully. And there's nothing in it at all to worry about. It's simply physical derangement. A glass of beer, a piece of dry bread, and in one moment the brain is stronger, the mind is clearer, and the will is firm. You could tackle any mountain, talk to any girl. It's awesome. Whew. How utterly petty it all is. It's like they call it liquid courage for a reason. But in spite of this scornful reflection, he was by now looking cheerful as though he were suddenly set free from a terrible burden. And he gazed round in a friendly way at the people in the room. It was like beer goggles, too. Everything and everyone looks better when you're a little drunk. But even at that moment, he had a dim foreboding that his happier frame of mind was also not normal. It's like, you get that way when you're, like, a little tipsy. When you've had, like, just enough to drink, it's like everything can feel and be awesome. So there's a balance, though. It's like when you... It, 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 the more you drink, the harder and harder it is to achieve that feeling, and it's like you get to a point where it's extremely difficult to get to that point. If you drink too much, it's, and it, it doesn't feel that way. But even at that moment, he had a dim foreboding that this happy frame of mind was not normal. There were a few people at that time in the tavern. Besides the two drunken men he'd met on the steps, a group consisting of about five men and a girl with a con concertina. Concertina is a word I need to look up because I don't know what that means. A small musical instrument, typically polygonal in form. Polygon is a five-sided shape. From poly. Polygon. Memories serve me, right? Polygons have five sides. Oh, that's a pentagon. Polygons are multiple sided shapes. Okay. Pentagon, yeah, pentagon, sorry. I should know. Triangle, square, pentagon. Hexagon, heptagon, octagon, of course. Polygonal simply means it has multiple sides. Played by stretching and squeezing between the hands to work a central bellows that blows air over reeds, each note being surrounded by a button. Compare with accordion. Some things it is better for me to see. So let me see if I can look it up in a Google search. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just like an accordion. Let me show you guys too, so you can see. You folks. Nowadays, they're pretty rare. I can't even remember the last time I saw an accordion. I think Weird Al Yankovic playing one is the last time I've seen it. Here to 
departure left the room quiet and rather empty. Persons still in the tavern were a man who appeared to be an artisan, drunk but not extremely so, sitting before a pot of beer. And his companion, a huge stout man with a gray beard and a short full skirted coat. He was very drunk and had dropped asleep on the bench. Every now and then he began as though in his sleep, cracking his fingers with his arms wide apart and the upper part of his body bouncing, uh, sorry, bounding about on the bench while he hummed some meaningless refrain, trying to recall some such lines as these. His wife, a year he fondly loved his wife, a year he fondly loved suddenly waking up again. Walking along the crowded row, he met the one he used to know. But no one shared his enjoyment. His silent companion looked with positive hostility and mistrust at all these manifestations. Yeah, that's another cool thing about being drunk, is sometimes you're just completely unpredictable. <laughs> it's like you can, spare, you can scare people with just a few drinks because they don't know what, <laughs> what you're going to do. I don't think I'm that way. I'd say when I'm had a few drinks, it increases the things that I do. Like I become a little bit more expressive. Like I say and do things that I wouldn't do in my normal closeted reserved state. But um, let's see, what, what's there to say about this? <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the booze are having an effect on him that everyone else is like, darn, I wish I was like that. Can I get whatever he's having? <laughs> it's like his friend's the loud drunk. Some, some drunks just get loud and some people just pass out when they get that drunk. <laughs> There's another man in the room who looks somewhat like a retired government clerk. He was sitting apart, now and then sipping from his pot and looking around at the company. He too appeared to be in some agitation. It's like, what's he singing about? I'm just here trying to enjoy my drinks. And there's this guy in the bar singing. What's he doing that for? Yeah, chapter two is freaking long, so I think I'll save it for tomorrow. But so far, I'm loving this book. Like, it's great. Crime and Punishment, yo, chapter one. Yeah, I think I already prefer it to War and Peace. Like, it's... It's got interactions that are relatable to me they make sense like it's the guy he's trying to come up with rent it doesn't feel like we're like looking at a bunch of rich folk talking you know talking about stuff that doesn't really matter it seems like we're like looking at through the lens at a guy who's like struggling through life it's a lot easier to relate to that kind of character than like Russian royalty is what I'm saying and I don't know, I think it's cool in that way. It's like, it's easier to understand what the main character is going through. Because he's... Yeah, he's, easy, he's easier to relate to. Okay, War and Peace, Chapter 6. We're finally getting closer to battle. <laughs> and we're in book, book 2. Book 2, Chapter 6. Kutuzov fell back toward Vienna. Destroying behind him the bridges over the river's inn at Branau and Tran, near Linz. On October 23rd, the Russian troops were crossing the river ends. At midday, the Russian baggage train, the artillery, excuse me, and columns of troops were defiling through the town of ends on both sides of the bridge. 
So there's a warm, rainy, autumnal day. I also think it interesting that both Leo and Theodore Dostoevsky start some of their chapters remarking about the seasons. I think it's a good way to start, too, because it tells you what time of the year it's in. So, like, in the case of Crime and Punishment, it's like we're starting during hot summer days in July. Chapter 6, book 2, it's like it's we're in the fall already, it's rainy. Um, and it, it's rainy, it's in the fall. Um, we're, yeah, we're getting closer to combat. I almost forgot I was gonna say that for a second. So, what, what did I wanna say? Something about the war. The wide expanse that opened out before the heights on which the Russian battery stood guarding the bridge was at times veiled by a diaphanous curtain of slanting rain. Diaphanous. It's a word you can use to impress your friends. It means light, delicate, and translucent of fabric. So it's like you can see through it. And Daphne's dress of pale gold. Ooh. <laughs> This case it's rain. There's slanting rain. Rain itself, I mean you could see through it. But I think part of the reason for that is because number one, it's water. Number two, when it's falling, it doesn't it's not like fog. Like it doesn't obscure vision at all usually when it rains. Unless you're like driving there pouring like cats and dogs. Even then, you just use your windshield wipers. Yeah, I'd say the puddles that are on the ground are a bigger hindrance than visibility when it's raining. It's like slick, slick roads are a bigger hazard than the effect that rain has on visibility. Typically, anyway. And then suddenly spread out from the sunlight, far distant objects could be clearly seen glittering as though freshly varnished. Down below, the little town could be seen with its white red roofed houses, its cathedral and its bridge, on both sides of which stream jostling masses of Russian troops. And the nice little red roof houses are about to be blown to smithereens <laughs> by artillery fire in the midst of combat. Succeed the lovely town before it's destroyed! <laughs> At the bend of the Danube, vessels and island with the castle of the park surrounded by the waters of the confluence of the Enns and the Danube became visible, and the rocky left bank of the Danube covered with pine forests with a mystic background of green treetops and bluish gorges. Dang, sounds beautiful. <laughs> the turrets of a comet stood out beyond a wild virgin pine forest. Far away on the other side of the Enns, the enemy's horse patrols could be discerned. Along the field of guns on the brow of the hill, the general in command of the rear guards stood with a staff officer, scanning the country through his field glass. A little behind them, Nesvitsky, who had been sent to the rear guard by the commander-in-chief, was sitting on the trail of a gun carriage. The Cossack who accompanied him had handed him a knapsack and a flask, and Nesvitsky was treating some officers to pies and real Delfo Kummel. Yeah, I don't know if that is. I wonder if dictionary can tell me what it means. I assume some sort of food or something. I guess it's not that important, I don't think. It's like the wallet, it's not that important. The officers gladly gathered around him, some on their knees, some squatting Turkish Turkish fashion on the wet grass. Yes, the Austrian prince who built that castle was no fool. It's a fine place. Why are you not eating anything, gentlemen? Nesvitsky was saying. Thank you very much, Prince, answered one of the officers. Please to be talking to a staff officer of such importance. It's a lovely place. You passed close to the park and saw two deer. Now what a splendid house. Look, Prince, said another who would have dearly liked to take another pie but felt shy. 
therefore pretending to be examining the countryside. See, our infantrymen have already got there. Look there in the middle behind the village. Three of them are dragging something. They'll ransack that castle, he remarked with evident approval. So they will, said Nesbitsky. No, but what I should like, added he, munching a pie in his moist-lipped, handsome mouth, would be to slip in over there. Always expect people in times of chaos and wartime to try to profit as much as they can. Looting. <laughs> Looting will ensue. So let's take advantage of this. these people fighting each other to lay waste to this castle. <laughs> he pointed with a smile to a turreted, turreted nunnery. And his eyes narrowed and gleamed. That would be fine, gentlemen. The officers laughed. Just to flutter the nuns a bit. They say there are Italian girls among them. On my word, I'd give five years of my life for it. They must be feeling dull too, said one of the bold officers, older officers laughing. <laughs> give that Pope a sword. <laughs> Meanwhile, the staff officer standing in front pointed out something to the general, who looked through his field glass. This is probably about... What, something like 500 miles north of Rome, I, I would think. Something like that. Maybe more. Um, almost a thousand kilometers. About ten hours, ten and a half hours to drive if you're driving from Rome to Brano. Present day Austria. Yes, so it is, so it is, said the general angrily, lowering the field glass and shrugging his shoulders. So it is. They'll be fired on at the crossing. Why are they dawdling there? From the opposite side, the enemy could be seen by the naked eye. And from their battery, a milk-white cloud rose. Then came the distant report of a shot, and our troops could be seen hurrying to the crossing. Nesvitsky rose, puffing, and went up to the general, smiling. Would not your excellency like a little refreshment, he said. It's a bad business, said the general without answering him. Our men have been wasting time. Big, true. <laughs> it's like... They're all like partying and dancing and trying to find a lost wallet. And it's like, don't you guys know there's a battle around the bend? Like, shouldn't we be training or something? Getting ready for combat, something like that. Like that right there is probably the reason why Napoleon's gonna win the next battle. Hadn't I better ride over, Your Excellency? Asked Nozitsky. Yes, please do, answered the general. And he repeated the order that had already once been given in detail. And tell the Hussars that they are to cross last and to fire the bridge as I ordered. And the inflammable material on the bridge must be reinspected. A kindly reminder, gentlemen, we are in wartime. <laughs> Very good, answered Nizvitsky. He called a Cossack with his horse, told him to put away the knapsack and flask, and swung his heavy person easily into the saddle. Those poor horses. <laughs> I really call in on the nuns, he said to the officers who watched him smilingly. And he rode off by the winding path down the hill. Now then, let's see how far it will carry, Captain. Just try, said the general, turning to an artillery officer. Have a little fun to pass the time. Crew, to your guns, commanded the officer. In a moment, the men came running gaily from their campfires and began loading. One, came the command. Number one jumped briskly aside. The gun rang out with a deafening metallic roar, and a whistling grenade flew above the heads of our troops, below the hill, and fell short of the enemy, a little smoke showing the spot where it burst. The faces of officers and men brightened up at the sound. Everyone got up and began watching the movements of our troops below, as plainly visible as if but a stone's throw away, and the movements of the approaching enemy farther off. At the same instant, the sun came fully out from behind the clouds, and the clear sound of a solitary shot and the brilliance of the bright sunshine merged in a single joyous and spirited impression. Like they finally get to see some action. 
<laughs> I was like, hallelujah, we finally get to fight. <laughs> chapter is two chapters away. Next chapter is chapter seven. Chapter seven is pretty long. I think I'll save it for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll be covering book two, chapter seven, One Piece, and chapter two, and Crime and, Punish Crime and Punishment. And it will probably be um, at four to six p.m. Sometime in the late afternoon or evening, I might start earlier as we did today with gameplay from Nickelodeon All Star Brawl. And yeah, if they have any discounts on Resident Evil or any scary games, we might try to work in some of that gameplay too. I might try to showcase. Uh, my piano progress too. Tomorrow, belay the music. I may be ready to play the more advanced version of music, but um, yeah, if not, we'll just start with Nickelodeon and just try very hard mode. Alrighty, so more piece. Quick recap: We are finally seeing some action. <laughs> Although that's not to bag on Leo. It, I think he's using these moments of, what's it called? Like, uh, when nothing's happening. Yeah, there's a word for it, but I can't think of it right now. It's like, he uses these moments where there's not a lot going on to tell us more about the characters, things that are happening between them, behind the lines. Like we've, so far we've seen a lot of explosions happening off the battlefield, basically, and now we're starting to see more explosions happening on the battlefield. I think it's so far a good book, War and Peace. And thank you all for joining me for this series, of course reading series War and Peace and Crime and Punishment. Crime and Punishment, a quick recap, we're introduced to the character, what's his name, this, Raskolnikov, yeah, Raskolnikov, he's down on his luck, he's a bit antisocial, he's behind on rent, he's trying to scrape money together, and we're uh, we're left with a drunken bar scene. And yeah, I'd have to say I'm impressed with both authors so far. Like Fyodor Dostoevsky, just really great so far. That first chapter. I think it's a little bit easier for me than War and Peace, but I think both novels have merit, and I'm eager to see where both books will take us, where both stories will end up, and see what we have to learn from both of these books. And I hope you've enjoyed this reading series with me. Thank you, of course, for watching, supporting the show. Storm Show, signing out.